Hi, welcome to this video on the clinical examination of the wrist. Uh, I'm Dr. Roger Hawkes, Chief Medical Officer of the European Tour, that's golf. And I'd like to introduce Doug Campbell, who is a wrist surgeon and a member of our advisory board. Traditionally, the wrist has been a difficult joint for sports physicians and physiotherapists to understand. Over the last four years, we've been studying the wrist on the European Tour, and we thought it'd be good to share some of the, our experience with you and help design an examination which all of you perhaps should be able to do in your everyday clinical practice. We're not going to try and demonstrate to you a clinical wrist examination that would be performed in a specialist wrist clinic or that performed by a wrist surgeon. What we'd like to do is to try and explain some of the simpler tests and some of the more common pathological findings that you'll see in your everyday practice so that you feel comfortable in examining a wrist. And certainly five years ago, I was in the same position of, as most of you now, and certainly didn't have a good grasp of how to wrist, examine the wrist properly. As you'll see in, in the following sequences, it is not that difficult to become quite confident and competent in doing this examination. Of course, it's important to understand the characteristics of the pain. Did it come on suddenly during an incident? Or has it come on more slowly as a result of a change of technique? It's important, to, of course, to understand the nature of the pain. Is it dull or is it sharp? Does the pain radiate? And of course, always remembering that morning stiffness and rheumatological conditions can occur in sports people as much as they can occur in anyone. And then we need to relate it to the sport. Of course, one of the characteristics of sports medicine is that you do understand your sport and understand the movements of the risks that occur in your sport. The foundation of diagnosis in problems of the wrist is the clinical history and most patients will complain of pain. So to identify accurately the localization of the pain will give you a head start as to trying to ascertain the area of pathology. If we look at the wrist, pain will either be described on the radial side, on the ulnar side or centrally. There are three possible locations. A fourth possible location is if the patient complains of global pain without being able to accurately localise one specific area. You can further subdivide this into dorsal or palmar. And once you've ascertained the exact localisation, you'll then be able to produce a short list of possible diagnoses. In order to begin the examination, it's important to understand that both limbs must be visible, must be bare below the elbows, with removal of watches and jewellery so that the full limb can be inspected. Good light is important, and if the patient is wearing dark clothing, it provides a fabulous contrast so that the contours of the wrist can be easily seen uh, subtly and carefully. You need to have a tabletop nearby so that you can rest onto that table to perform certain manoeuvres, which we'll demonstrate later. So we begin the examination by inspection. The first thing that we're looking at is the contours of the wrist. We're looking for the natural, subtle grooves and hollows and seeing if the skin creases on the palmar surface are present. It doesn't take a lot of edema to stretch the skin out and lose the skin creases. So this is a difficult sign to appreciate when you're first looking, but when you've seen a few swollen wrists, you'll very easily understand that swelling will remove the skin creases very quickly. You're looking at the posture of the hand, the natural resting posture of the fingers and the wrist, which should be in slight ulnar deviation. We then like to look at the hand end on in order to assess the prominence of the distal ulna. Certain people have a very prominent distal ulna and some have prominent distal ulna in one side and not the other, which is likely to be related to their injury. It may be that the distal ulna is the issue, but more often than not, it is the supination of the ulnar side of the carpus which falls down and creates an apparent prominent distal ulna. And relocating the carpus will allow you to see that in fact the distal ulna is not abnormal, but the carpus is. It is important to assess the range of movement 
and this is traditionally done actively. First of all, we look for extension, and then flexion, and then we look at supination and pronation, and then ulnar deviation and radial deviation. It's important that any loss of extension is fully investigated. Up until now, we've been looking for asymmetry, but it's important that we load the joint, and passive loaded wrist extension will often provoke symptoms in the central dorsal region. An accurate understanding of the skeletal anatomy underlying the surface landmarks will help guide you to accurate palpation of areas of tenderness. So I'll now draw the skeletal anatomy on the hand and wrist. The starting point would be the palpable radial styloid and also the palpable ulnar styloid. These structures will form a line that does not go perpendicular to the long axis of the limb as you would expect but passes slightly obliquely with the ulnar styloid being proximal to the radial styloid. The distal ulna and the distal radius. The scaphoid, the lunate and the triquetrum. The ulnar styloid is palpable here and the ulna moves around in a more proximal direction. The triquetrum is a three-dimensional structure. One of the first tests to perform before isolating any uh, tenderness uh, or sites of discomfort is to assess the flexibility of the wrist. The wrist will naturally have a flexible joint which will appear to clunk as you ask the patient to relax, hold the distal radius and distal ulna in one hand and the proximal carpal row in the other and move it in an anterior posterior direction. This natural clunk is called pseudo instability because it is apparently unstable, but this is the normal finding. Lack of pseudo instability will occur when there's a thickened joint lining and therefore a rigid capsule, or if there's extrinsic muscle spasm caused by pain and limitation of motion in a functional way. So once the location of the underlying anatomy is clear, you can begin to palpate these structures and find where the maximal area of tenderness is. And in order to have a methodical approach to this, I begin proximally by palpating in the distal radial ulna joint. And then, depending on whether the pain has been isolated as being radial or ulnar, I would start on the opposite side to the discomfort. So in this case, the description is ulnar-sided wrist pain, so I would begin palpation on the radial side of the radiocarpal joint, across to the central aspect, and then into the ulnocarpal joint, looking for areas of tenderness. I would, of course, palpate the scaphalunate ligament area and the lunotriquetral ligament area, as well as moving onto the ulnar side and palpate along the ulnar border of the wrist and particularly just palmar to the ulnar styloid, an area known as the ulnar fovea. We're often asked about the triangular fibre cartilage and it's most important to know that it's the actual stability function of this structure which is most important and the most important stability function is that of the distal radial ulnar joint. I'm now going to demonstrate how you actually assess this. First of all, you hold the radius uh, in, your, in your left hand and then hold the ulna in your right and go into ulnar deviation. And then move the ulna forwards and backwards and there should be a fair amount of movement like this.
To check whether the fibre cartridge is working well, you then move the wrist into radial deviation and try and move the ulna like you did before. And as you can see, it stabilises nicely in this case. Another common area of problems in the ulna side of the wrist is the area around the extensor carpi ulnaris tendon. This is a particular problem in a number of different sports. So I'll just draw the extensor carpi ulnaris tendon on the wrist and then demonstrate some tests with which to assess its stability and also whether or not it's the source of any pain from tendonitis. The extensor carpi ulnaris tendon can tear out of its retaining sheath. The sheath is known as the sixth extensor compartment. If it does tear out of its sheath, it becomes unstable and can sublux in certain movements. The tendon will change position relative to the position of forearm rotation. So if we put the arm into this position and actively rotate, the tendon will move position relative to its retaining structures. A test to perform in order to assess the stability of the tendon is known as the COBRA test, where we flex the wrist and fingers and ask the patient to actively rotate the forearm whilst watching the extensor carpi ulnaris tendon here. When the tendon sheath is torn and the tendon can sublux away from its natural groove, the patient will often complain of a snap or a clunk. Here's an example of a patient with an unstable extensor carpi ulnaris sheath. Whilst the ECU tendon may be stable, it may be affected by tendonitis and pain on certain active movements. And one very good test to assess the structural integrity of the sheath and also any presence of tendonitis is the ECU synergy test where the patient is asked to put both thumbs together and to push away on each thumb. And if pain is felt along the side here in the course of the extensor carpi ulnaris tendon, then that would be positive for tendonitis. If the tendon clicks out of joint, then again this is another expression of extensor carpi ulnaris instability. Another common cause of tenderness pain around the wrist is on the radial side of the wrist at the thumb base, de Quervain's tendonitis. This condition affects the tendons which pass through the first extensor compartment, abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis. And we can see these if the patient lifts the thumb in the air and holds it in this position against resistance. We can see that the tendon is visible on the lower part of the anatomical snuff box. The clinical test to diagnose de Quervain's tendonitis is called Finkelstein's test. To perform Finkelstein's test, you ask the patient to flex the elbow into the side and then to flex the thumb into the palm and grab hold of the thumb with the other fingers and then ulnar deviate the wrist. If the patient feels pain or tightness along the course of these tendons, then that would be regarded as a positive Finkelstein's test and a diagnosis of de Quervain's tendonitis. So we hope you found this useful and in particular we'd like you to take away some learning points, namely the importance of isolating the exact location of pain before you begin your clinical examination and then a thorough understanding of the underlying skeletal anatomy whilst you're performing your palpation as well as these more specialised but as you see fairly straightforward clinical tests. Think about the wrist and hand movements in your particular sport and I'm sure you'll find it very useful.